Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. Let's look at maximum product subarray. And this is actually a dynamic programming problem and I'm gonna show you how to solve this problem easily. So we're given an integer array of numbers and we wanna find the contiguous subarray that contains at least num one number and has the largest product. So in this case, we have a two, a three, a negative two, and a four. And the largest continuous product we can make is two and three because two times three is six. That is the largest product. We can't really make it bigger because there's a negative two. If we multiply this by negative two, it's gonna be negative 12. That's not bigger than six. So what's like your first idea how to solve this problem? Maybe brute force, right? Is there a brute force solution to this? Well, we wanna find a subarray, right? So why don't we just try every single subarray? So let's say all subarrays starting at two, we got one subarray, two subarrays, three, four, right? And for each of these, let's just calculate the product, right? Like the first one is two, the next one is two times three, the next one is two times three times negative two, the last one is two times three times negative two times four. And we end up saying that so far the biggest is this, but we're technically not done yet. All of these subarrays contain two. So now let's look at all subarrays containing three. So we got one, right, just three. Then we got three times negative two. Then we got three times negative two times four. And basically we repeat this process. Now you can tell that this is not super efficient. The time complexity is big O n squared. For each of these numbers, we're gonna end up having n uh, subarrays, and we see that the total number of elements we have is also n, right? It's n elements in the array, so we're gonna get n times n is n squared. So my question is, can we do better? And how can we do better? Maybe there's some patterns to this problem that we can use to our advantage to find a better solution than n squared. So let's look at one example. Do you notice anything about this subarray? Well, all elements are positive. So what does that end up doing? Like this is all positive. So we got a one, okay. And next we wanna check this subarray. Okay, multiply it by two. We wanna go even farther, check the three. Okay, multiply it by three. And what if we kept having positive elements? Four, five, multiply by four, multiply by five. Do you notice something? Up until this point, our product is gonna be a one. Up until this point, it's gonna be a two. Up until this point, it's gonna be a six. Up until this point, it's gonna be a 24. Up until this point, it's gonna be 120. If we have positive numbers, no matter what happens, they're gonna keep increasing, right? So this is the simple case. If we get all positive numbers, then our product is always gonna be increasing. So now let's actually look at the opposite scenario. What if we had all negative numbers? Because all positives is easy. You just multiply all of them and you get the max product. But with negative numbers, it's a lot more tricky. So let's look at the first number. So up until here, the max product is just negative one. And then we, we add a second element, a negative two. And then what do we get? We get negative one times negative two. And we know that the product of that is two, right? Positive two. Now the last subarray we check from all the way from negative one to negative three. So we introduce one more value, a negative three. And now if we multiply all three of these numbers together, we see that our product actually got smaller. Now it's negative six. And what's gonna happen if we had a, another element over here? What if we had a negative four? Then we multiply by negative four, and now we see that our product is gonna be 24. So you see that when you have negatives consecutively, the sign is alternating. So when you want the maximum, it makes it kind of tricky to have negatives. But we also see that even though we got a negative six over here, there's actually a subarray that has a better solution. If you just take these two numbers, negative two times negative three, we get a positive six. So why did we get a negative six over here? How can we find the real maximum, which is positive six? 
So even though we're looking for the max product subarray, we're actually also gonna need to keep track of the minimum as well. And I'm gonna show you why. So first, do you at least agree with me that if we wanna find the max product array subarray of this, of the, of the entire thing, it might be helpful for us to at least solve the sub problem, which is the max product subarray of just the first two elements first, and then use that to get the entire one. Okay, that makes sense. We know that the max product subarray of this is two. Now, if we had a positive three over here, then we would say, okay, if I can get the max subarray of the first two elements and multiply it by three, I'm gonna get two times three. It works when these are positive numbers, but we actually have a negative three over here. So I'm gonna say, get the max product subarray, which is positive two, but let's also get the, the minimum product subarray of these two as well. And what do we know about the minimum? What's the minimum product subarray of these two? It's gonna be negative two. So I'm gonna keep track of both positive and negative. So we have a positive two and a negative two. We keep the max and we keep the minimum. So now when we wanna compute the max product subarray, when we include this three, then we can compute that. We can compute that using both of these values. So we know that when we take the maximum two, we get negative three times two, which is negative six. And we know when we take the minimum, we get, we get negative three times negative two, and that gives us a result of positive six. So we know the maximum is positive six and the minimum is negative six. So we take positive six and put it over here and we can take negative six and put it over here. And hypothetically, maybe we get another element and this time, and this time, whether it's positive or negative, right? So if, in this case, let's say it's a negative four, we will be able to find the solution because the minimum, or rather we're looking for the max product subarray. And we know if we take negative four, multiply it by the current minimum, which is a negative number, negative six, we will end up getting 24, which is what we're looking for. But if you reverse it, what if we had a positive four here instead? Well, in that case, we can say, okay, positive four multiplied by our maximum, right? Our maximum, which is positive six. So four times positive six, we get 24. We still get it, right? So this, if we maintain the maximum and the minimum, we have all the information we need as we continue to add more elements to our array. So now let's just look at one edge case. So we're talking about positive numbers and negative numbers, but we know that one last edge case exists, the dreaded zero value, right? So what if we had a zero value and then maybe some other numbers, three, five, our zero is gonna kind of kill us, right? It's gonna kill our streak. Like, look what's gonna happen to our min and max. If we take six multiplied by zero, we get zero. If we take negative six multiplied by zero, we get zero again, right? X times zero equals zero. And then if we try taking this zero and making it a product of maybe three and five, it's gonna continue being zero, right? Because any number times zero is gonna be zero. So I'm gonna decide to handle this in a different way. So anytime we get a zero value, I'm gonna reset our max to zero or rather to one. And I'm also gonna reset our minimum to one. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because I don't want to kill our product, right? I'm just gonna say that zeros are ignored. We don't really care about zeros. And the reason I'm setting this to one is because then when we start introducing new values like three, it's just gonna be one times three, right? Which is gonna end up being three. So one is like a neutral value for us. So those are the main things. We wanna maintain the max and minimum of our product and we want to handle the zero case by resetting 
everything to a neutral value like one. Okay, so now let's code it out. I'm gonna say our result is initially just gonna be set to the max value contained in nums because we at least have to set it to some value. We can't just initialize it to zero because what if we had an array with just one number and it happened to be negative one, right? In that case, this is our max product, which is even less than zero. So zero is not a good default case. And I'm gonna maintain the current min and the current max and I'm gonna initialize these to one each because we know one is like a neutral value. And then we're just gonna start iterating through every single number in our input array. We know that if we ever get to a zero, we do not wanna handle that. We don't wanna add that as a part of our product. So we don't wanna mess up our current min and max by multiplying it by zero because then it's gonna stay zero forever. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna reset our min and our max to one each. And we're just gonna to continue to the next iteration of the loop. If this doesn't execute, that's when we're gonna actually do our code and recompute the current min and current max. So our current max, how are we actually gonna compute it? Well, in Python, it's really convenient for us because we can say, okay, the current max could potentially be the, the new number that we just found multiplied by the current max. If the current max happens to be positive and n is positive, it could also end up being the the input value n multiplied by the current minimum, right? What if n is negative and current minimum is negative? Then this could end up being a positive number, which could be our current maximum. The third option is n itself, because what if we had an input such as negative one and eight? Well, in that case, the current min and max is gonna end up being negative one and Either of those numbers multiplied by eight, which could be our hypothetical n value, it's gonna end up being negative eight. So eight it's by itself, which is n, is the maximum. And the fun thing about Python is that, look, we just put three values into our max function. Some languages don't allow for this, but there's obviously ways to get around it. And so now that we have our current max, we can do the exact same thing for our current min. So min, so we can actually take all three of these values, copy and paste them, and then put them in the min because we want whatever the min containing n is, and it could be anything. It could be n times current max, n times current min, or n itself. So an example would be negative one and negative eight. If we multiply these together, we get a positive eight, but we don't want that. We want the minimum, which could be just negative eight by itself, which would be this third case. But this is where I always end up with a bug. So do you see how we actually recomputed the current max, but we want to use the old current max? So I'm actually going to have a temporary variable up here, temp. And before we end up reassigning current max, I'm just going to compute current max times n and then save it in temp so then we can use it down here. So we're gonna replace this with temp. So this way we're always keeping track of what the current max is and what the current minimum is. And so we can update our result after each iteration of the loop and we want the max product so we can take the maximum of result itself because result could still be the max, current max and current minimum. So that's actually it, like we've done it and we can now just return what our result. And so this is actually not that much code and it's not even like when you look at it, it's hard to recognize that it's even a dynamic programming problem because it's not like we're storing an entire array like DP and then having an array. We're just maintaining two values, current min and current max. And what they tell us is for let's say for example we were at this value n then we're gonna have the current maximum of this subarray and the current minimum product of this subarray and then when our n gets shifted to the next value 
we're going to have the current maximum of these three and the current minimum product of these three. And then by the time our n value is out of bounds, we will have the current max and the current minimum of the entire array computed. So it runs efficiently, and that's because we're only iterating through the input. So instead of being n squared, the time complexity is just big O of n. The memory complexity is big O of one because we are not using an array. We're just using uh, single variables. I hope this was helpful. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot, and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon.